This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're releasing one of my all-time favorite podcasts. So if you know me, you know that I love all things pelvic floor, pelvic health-related we talk about diastasis. That whole world is so important to me, especially since the birth of my first child. So I'm re-releasing my podcast with Leslie Howard. If you don't know her, she's an Oakland-based, internationally acclaimed yoga educator who pioneered the growing field of yoga for pelvic health. And this podcast is called Pelvic Liberation with Leslie Howard. So the reason I'm re-releasing it, besides the fact that I love the pelvic floor and I love this conversation. PYC is moving locations. Granted, it's one block east, but it's still we're packing up one place and going to another. And I have to tell you, I'm a little over my head with this. I'm incredibly excited. The studio has been painted. We ordered some new stuff. There's a lot to do. So I had to take a beat from my interviews and I'm taking some of my favorites the next few weeks and re-releasing them. I do have four amazing interviews set up, which I'm so excited for to come. So you guys will hear some new stuff soon, but in the meantime, please enjoy the conversation with Leslie Howard. Also, as I mentioned, the studio is moving and we're doing an iPhone women crowdfunding. And I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Miranda Hammer. She's also known as the crunchy radish. We did a podcast with her, I believe it was back last February on nutrition for the mama. So thank you, Miranda, for your support of the studio. I really appreciate that. That said, so along with the studio moving, along with the podcast, I have been revamping my Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi online course. So I'm re-releasing it pretty soon. So if you're a yoga teacher out there who's not specialized in prenatal, but you sometimes have the pregnant student in class and you may not know what to do, this course is for you. And then of course, there are the yoga teachers that want to make prenatal yoga their specialty. And our New York teacher training is starting very soon. And then Caprice and I are off to Charlotte, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., back into Manhattan in the spring, and then Richmond, Virginia, so you can catch us on the road. Okay, we're going to take a super quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear from Leslie. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg, and I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies. And today, I'm talking to Leslie Howard, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, oddly one of my favorite topics, the pelvic floor. So let me tell you a little bit about Leslie. Leslie Howard is an Oakland-based, internationally acclaimed yoga educator who pioneered the growing field of yoga for pelvic health. Sanama Health named her one of the top 50 yoga instructors in the USA. 
Leslie leads pelvic floor yoga certification trainings and other workshops across the United States and internationally. Her teaching is informed by over 3,500 hours of study with senior Iyengar yoga teachers, including Manu Somanis, Patricia Walden, and Ramadad Patel. In 2013, Leslie, with contribution of Judith Lassiter, co-designed two successful studies at UCSF Medical Center that demonstrates the effectiveness of her yoga techniques for incontinence and pelvic pain. Leslie's own struggle to heal her hips and pelvis led her to an intense study of the anatomy, physiology, cultural messaging, history, and energetics of this complex area of the body. Her new book, Pelvic Liberation, is available through Amazon. To find out more about Leslie, go to www. Dot LeslieHowardYoga.com. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to speak about this. So those that have been listening to the podcast or take my classes know that I love to educate people at the pelvic floor. So I couldn't think of a better person to have on than you because you really, it seems to be a passion of yours just as much as mine. Absolutely. <laughs> So, That's true. <laughs> um, so can you just start by explaining the importance of understanding and investigating one's personal pelvic floor since everyone's pelvic floor is different with different issues? Well, unfortunately, the only time people tend to pay attention to it is when there's something going wrong. So I'm a big advocate of, you know, know what your normal is so that if something isn't going right, you know, like sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, it's important to have a healthy pelvic floor because it's really kind of the foundation for everything in our bodies. Uh, the pelvic floor is the integral part of the core muscles that hardly anyone ever talks about. Um, and so, you know, they have a big responsibility to hold up our, uh, internal organs. So pretty important. Uh, everybody has really different issues. Uh, I would say women have more instability issues because of the structure of the pelvic floor and men tend to have more, uh, tight issues, overly tight issues. So you, do you want me to go specific with issues? Do you no, tell me? I think, that, um, I think that's good. So let's talk a little bit about what brought you to learning about your pelvic floor. <sighs> well, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'd been a yoga teacher for about 15 years, and I started having pelvic pain, which manifested in sitting more than 20 minutes was really painful. Uh, sex with my husband was becoming increasingly challenging, meaning, uh, it was painful. It was hard for him to get inside of me. Uh, and then I started avoiding it because I just kept anticipating it was going to hurt. So it was, it took, our relationship took a huge hit because of it. And I didn't find help right away because, uh, there's not enough people talking about it. So, you know, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was, I thought, oh my God, is this perimenopause? Like, you know, I didn't know. And, uh, I finally found my way to an internal physical therapist who I believe are leading, leading the charge in this, uh, field. I really feel that, uh, internal physical therapists, uh, as opposed to physical therapists that don't go inside the body, uh, know a lot more about the muscular fascial connections than, than most, uh, MDs and gynecologists really. I completely agree. After the birth of my son, um, I saw a a urogynecologist and she said, Oh, just keep kegeling. And I did. And it actually seemed to make it not any better. And then, um, being in a great, I had also been doing this work for a while. So I was a little surprised that that was her response, but still I, you know, part of my brain is like, Oh, MD, I better, I better go to her. And then I went to an internal physical therapist who was, first of all, it was a little strange to get over the internal for me. I don't know. For some people it, it maybe is not, but for me, I'm like, Oh, is this what we're doing in PT? Um, but she, really, you know, cause I've had physical therapy for like my ankles. And so this is clearly yeah. different. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very. but it, she seemed to have so much more understanding and nuance understanding. So if we can talk a little bit about the difference between hypotonic and hypertonic, because, you know, everyone just thinks, Oh, I'm having pelvic floor issues. I better Kegel. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, with the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. 
This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, until very recently, I pretty much the only information that's out there about female pelvic muscular health uh, was the infamous Kegel, Kegel. I'm not really sure how Miss Dr. Kegel would pronounce it. But anyway, um, you know, in 1948, that's a long time ago, uh, this doctor from LA introduced the idea of vaginal contractions because he was noticing many of his patients post- uh, post birth, were were complaining of lack of sensation, etc. Um, so that became kind of the, <laughs> the the hallmark of anything that was offered for women in this department, um, muscularly, you know. And so um, I don't really know if back in the <laughs> back in 1948, if people weren't hypertonic, I kind of doubt it. But um, you know, it's fairly common for uh, women's uh, pelvic muscles to be more on the lax side, which is hypotonic, after birth, but not necessarily. It also depends on the person. It, it depends on their birth experience. Uh, unfortunately, lots of women in our culture have very traumatic birth experiences, and their muscles go hypertonic, which means they clench, um, and they're very short and contracted. So, um you know, it used to be kind of like, uh, it was, I think it was the conventional wisdom. If you're a female, if you had a couple of babies, if you're getting older, oh my God, your pelvic floor must be falling towards your feet and girl, you got to just tighten it up. Um, but I, I have to say now that I've been teaching pelvic floor work for almost 10 years, I rarely find anyone too loose. I, almost everybody seems too tight. Um, so what that means is, you know, some people might be like, well, isn't that a good thing? Um, <laughs> that it's tight and it's like, you know, too much of a good thing. So yeah, we want tone, but not tight. So tight is not, uh, tight is not a good thing. Tight means the muscle is like a hand that's clenched that can't open. Um, too loose is like a hand open that can't close. Neither of those situations can help you hold hold a pen, you know? Um, so, so they said, you know, our pelvic floor muscles are voluntary muscles, uh, just like most of the muscles in our body. Uh, we, if we were taught correctly, you know, we should be able to activate them at will, but a lot of people are disconnected from them for a lot of good reasons. Um, but, uh, so that's the difference between hypo and hyper and People can have pelvic floors that are completely hypo or completely hyper, um, but also a lot of women have, because of the instability that I mentioned earlier, a lot of women are a combination of parts of their pelvic floor are too tight and parts of their pelvic floor are too lengthened and um, aren't able to contract very well. So this is why kegling doesn't really help. So if someone's listening to this and they're trying to figure out, well, well where am I? Hypo, hyper, combo. What are some of the traits of hypo, hyper, and combo? Uh, okay. So if you're hypo, I would say the more common condition is stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is when you jump, laugh, cough, sneeze, uh, run, uh, and you have some leakage. Um, now, you know, that's the conventional, uh, diagnosis is, Oh, you're having leakage. Then you need to tighten it up. However, again, because I've been doing this work a long time now, uh, I find there are a fair amount of people who don't think just because you have stress incontinence, Oh, therefore I'm loose. Um, because some 
women uh, are too tight. And what's happened is over time, they have um, maybe prolapsed their bladders because they're bearing down every day to defecate. Um, you know, that's pretty common where, uh, the, pre the daily pressure. So over years, over decades can actually prolapse one of the organs. The most common organ to prolapse is the bladder. Um, so it's, it gets to be a little more complicated. Um, but, but I would say probably with stress and incontinence, you've got a little bit more hypotonicity, but don't, assume that. And I'll, I'll give you some things to, to, uh, check. Um, the other thing is prolapsed organs can happen also because of looseness, but also prolapsing of the organs can be from, again, too much pushing during birth, uh, too much pushing, uh, you know, pushing during pooping, pushing during, uh, urination. A lot of women will get on the toilet to urinate and then with their abdominal, uh, pressure, they'll push down to make sure every drop is out. And that's actually not a very healthy thing to do. Um, so, so those are the two conditions that have been traditionally more associated with lack of tone. Um, but I just want to say not necessarily. So there's an asterisk on that. Okay. Um, uh, hypertonic, more common condition is urge incontinence. Urge incontinence is when you have the overwhelming, like, oh my God, I don't know if I'll make it feeling that you have to urinate. Um, sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't, uh, often you have this incredible feeling that your bladder is just overflowing and then you get in the bathroom and you pee for like five or six seconds. A full bladder should be minimum 10 seconds, maximum 30 seconds. So if you're getting the message to, uh, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, sometimes that's learned behavior. Uh, sometimes that is from hypertonicity, too much tightness. And so it's counterintuitive, but if you're having that condition, I would encourage you to try to take a couple deep breaths and relax your pelvic floor. And you might notice that that overwhelming urge just dissipates. Um, and then of course the other big problem with hypertonicity is pain, pelvic pain, which has lots of different conditions associated with it. Um, would you like me to go into that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, you know, I love hearing all of this. <laughs> uh, okay. The more common conditions are vulvodynia. Vulvodynia is when the outer, um, genitals hurt. Uh, they can feel irritated, raw, um, sometimes maybe itchy. Uh, it might feel like you can't stand to have any kind of like yoga tights or tight pants or you can't ride a bike or any pressure against your vulva uh, feels uncomfortable. Um, that is highly associated with hypertonicity. Uh, different condition called vaginismus is when the opening of the vagina um, starts to get smaller because one, the uh, most superficial layer of the pelvic floor surrounds the vaginal opening. So <clears throat> if your pelvic floor muscles are tight, um, uh, what happens is it starts to make the hole smaller. And so this is what was happening with me. Um, that was already happening. And then, you know, if my husband and I tried to have sex, I would start to clench because I was like, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt which made things worse. So that's a uh, very, that's another fairly common condition. Um, irritable bowel syndrome is associated with, uh, pelvic pain and hypertonicity. Um, a, a condition called interstitial cystitis, which is when you can't empty your bladder completely. And then, <coughs> excuse me, your bladder ulcerates, uh, that can be super painful. Um, yeah. So but those these are, the are great. These are great. So I have a question because I hear, um, the hypotonicity, I do hear from my students when they've had their babies and they come back and many of them are runners and be like, I was peeing myself as I ran. And then some of them also, <laughs> when we do certain poses, get air drawn into their vagina. Okay. Uh, and one well, was so embarrassed. She's like, I swear I didn't fart. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I hear that one a lot. Um, well, a couple of things with that question. So, you know, I, I know, <laughs> I know I'm probably going to get some pushback about this, but, um, you, you know, if you've just had a baby to start running again, it's 
probably not the best idea because your pelvic floor is in a fairly fragile state for a while. Um, well, I hope that, I mean, usually I advise them to wait at least six to eight weeks before getting back to that. So oh, hopefully they're not doing it in the first, you know, six to eight oh, days. With that. Um, you know, I think Hollywood is a little responsible for, you know, look, so-and-so got her, you know, got rid of her baby body in two weeks. And you're just like, oh God, um, you know, this obsession with like, I should look fine after having a baby as if making a human isn't a big deal. <laughs> you know? Um, but you know, your pelvic, again, based on your, uh, birth story, you know, did you tear? Did you have an episiotomy? How long were you pushing? Uh, did your pushing cause some prolapse of your organs? You know, sometimes the organs will, will, um, you know, lift back up, but it takes some time. And so running is just going to make it harder or, you know, create more damage. Um, so, so the running thing, you know, be careful, certainly six to eight weeks, you know, maybe even, 12 weeks. Um, that would be number one. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Air in the vagina. Okay. Air in the vagina. Okay. So if you've got a vaginal delivery, it's, um, more common with vaginal delivery that the vaginal walls, which are not pelvic floor muscles, the vaginal walls are tissue that have muscular fibers ingrained in them. So there's some muscularity to the vaginal walls. They do stretch out because the baby's head is big. Um, so what happens is the vaginal walls can keep that scent, that, that more, um, stretched out feeling at post birth. And that's where the air is coming in. So this is where a true Kegel engaging your vaginal walls comes in handy. Um, you know, and this is one of the things, one of my main teachings is, can we get specific enough in our own body? Can we feel enough in our own body that we're able to distinguish the left side, the right side, my vaginal walls engaging, my perineum lifting, my anus engaging. These are all different things. You know, what most people do is they just squeeze whatever and hope for the best. That's my definition of a Kegel. Um, so, uh, so the vaginal wall thing is, you know, what would help there is people ask me all the time about what do I think about, um, jade eggs or they have various names I, that I'm, it's escaping me right this minute, but, you know, putting a small item in your vagina and, and using it to, to, to get stronger in your vaginal walls. I think that's a good idea for people who are experiencing the air in the vagina syndrome. Um, but be careful, make sure that you don't have, uh, some hypertonicity lurking in your pelvic floor. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? Well, if you're not doing anything where anybody can see you right now, <laughs> you can just give yourself a little massage around your sitting bones and see if that there's any tenderness or um, any kind of hot spots of pain. So that's what I do in my class is I have women find their sitting bone and then massage on the inner side of the sitting bone, the front side, the back side for about a minute and just to see any tenderness. So that would be kind of a more easy, but more superficial, uh, diagnosis. Um, and then in my workshops, you know, I have a pelvic model where I, I can describe and instruct how to do an internal massage for a little bit better diagnosis of, do you have any tightness? So if you have over tightness, you're going to have pain or sensitivity. It should not hurt to push into your pelvic muscles. Um, so I, if you have any pain, that's going to tell you there's some hypertonicity. I've had students do that and some of them literally jump. And one of them actually thought it was just, she had a hamstring pull. And then she, we started to discuss it more because, you know, the issue of tuberosity attaching to the hamstring, she's like, she just yeah. assumed and, you know, oh, my hamstring, mm-hmm. I pulled it. And then we discussed it and we talked about some of what she was feeling and we realized her right side was chronically tight. And so then we started working with, okay, now you need to really work on just connecting to the breath. Cause she was um, a paradoxical breather or paradoxical. So she was holding her. So can you actually, um, since it's so common, let's, let's jump into that. What is paradoxical breathing and why is it not good for the pelvic floor? Okay. So, um, let me, before I say what it is, let me just sure. describe what, what healthy breathing is. Yes. 
So uh, most of us know that the the respiratory diaphragm is, has a slight dome shape, cause, so it sits in our the bottom of our rib cage, and it uh, the dome is filled up with all of our internal organs below it. And as our lungs fill with air, what happens is the diaphragm widens; it kind of becomes more of a, a flat shape, and it pushes down on the organs. And when the organs get pushed, they get pushed towards the pelvic floor, the bottom of our torso. And a healthy pelvic floor should expand a little bit to receive the organs. And then as the lungs create the uh, kind of the suction to exhale, uh, the organs rise back up. And the pelvic floor, again, if the pelvic floor is healthy, the pelvic floor should contract, lift up in a little dome shape to basically send the organs back up to the respiratory diaphragm, okay? So that, that's kind of a, a very simplified uh, <laughs> description of, of normal good breathing. Okay, what a paradoxical breather does is um, they actually are lifting their pelvic floor on the inhalation. They're pulling their abdomen in on the inhalation, um, which is creating um, a tightness in the pelvic floor. So again, Healthy breathing pelvic floor should should widen, stretch a little bit in the pelvic floor. Paradoxical breathing, the person's pulling up on their pelvic floor, they're drawing in on their abdomen. Um, so the pelvic floor is never getting uh, a healthy extension in the muscles. It's chronically held in a in a tightened state. Now, where does it come from? You know that. I would say trauma, if I just had to say one word, trauma, it could come from, uh, you know, past sexual abuse. It can come from uh, surgery. It can come from emotional abuse. Um, basically, it's a chronic bracing for impact, like something bad's going to happen so let me brace everything. Um, and then what happens is uh, uh, it, it, can become your, it can become your breathing pattern overall, or it can become your breathing pattern when you're stressed. Uh, and, and that can be like, I'm in really bad traffic right now, and I'm going into my you know, hypertonic uh, reverse breathing pattern. Um, and most people don't even notice it. Uh, I would say... My workshops average about 30 participants per workshop, and anywhere from a third to a half of the women are often saying, oh, my God, I never noticed that before. I am a reverse breather. So it's really common. Do you think any of it's learned? Because I feel like some things I hear, well, we get a lot of dancers, so I feel like they're all often pulled in. But then a lot of Pilates, navel to spine, yoga, they say navel to spine. So then they're creating, this is what I should be doing, and they're just sucking their stomachs in. Right. Uh, yeah, I think some of it's learned. I think that you bring up a good point. I think there's a lot of practices out there Um that you're instructed to do a particular type of breathing in the practice. And then what happens is the person goes, oh, this is the way I'm supposed to be breathing, consciously or unconsciously. They take that breathing pattern out into their life. So maybe it's just for a 30-minute or one-hour practice, and then they start adopting it. Um, ujjayi breathing and yoga. Um, you know, a lot of people come to see me, and I'm like, why are you breathing like that? And they're like, oh, I thought I was supposed to breathe like that. You know, and, and I'm like, yeah, maybe for your practice, but like not in life, you know, and they take it on. And so, you know, even ujjayi breathing, there's a misunderstanding and a tightening that can happen with that. So, yes, I, I do think it can be learned. It can also be passed on. Like if your mom, perhaps your mother was sexually abused and perhaps she has a, a tra traumatic breathing pattern, you know, you might just pick that up just from, you know, being her daughter. I, I've seen that where uh, people come in with pelvic floor issues to see me and, you know, I say, any, any sexual abuse in your history? No, no, no. And they're just presenting classically like a sexually abused uh, victim. And, and then come to work with them a little bit longer and they're like, you know, my mother was, but, she, but they weren't. So, you know, there you go. Uh, things get passed on. Um, Again, consciously or unconsciously. So it's, it's an interesting subject. 
Yeah, I notice a lot of people when we do some transverse abdominal work in class, they're the paradoxical breeze and they had no idea. So I try to gently just remind them kind of the um, physiological breathing. I have this image of a jellyfish that when it inhales, it, like when the jellyfish drops and spreads, that's an inhale, and then we exhale right. kind of domes, and people tend to get that. Are there other, um, well, not that abuse would ever be a choice, but are there are other lifestyle factors, I don't want to say necessarily choices, um, that could contribute to imbalance. Maybe how someone always stands or, uh, like a mom holding a child or even certain fitness genres. Okay. That's a big subject. <laughs> uh, okay. So one of, just the things I a few ideas. <laughs> one of the first things I ask somebody if they come to see me is what do you do all day? Meaning what's your posture all day? Do you have to sit at a desk? Do you have to stand and bake bread? Are you cutting hair? Are you, you know, um, leaning over your garden or your child? Um, you know, so we talk about, okay, you're eight hours a day. You have to be in this position. Let me see what that position looks like. So, you know, just these little things can add up to help you or hurt you. So, you know, if you're someone who rounds your back while you're sitting, you're rounding your lower back, which throws your head forward. Um, you know, if you're doing that, it, that's, that's a normal movement of the human body. But if you're doing it eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, you know, 30, 30 years, that adds up to shortening your pelvic floor. Um, or if you're standing on one leg all the time, you're standing out, you, you lock one knee and you bend the other, which is really common. Um, that's going to contribute to uh, imbalance in your pelvic floor. So, um, so you know, like being more conscious of your posture when you're sitting in the car, being more conscious of your posture when you're standing in the grocery line, um, you know, these small things can add up. So, you know, my history is hypertonic. You know, it wasn't, it didn't just happen because of one thing. It was a lot of things. What I noticed is, you know, when I got a, my yoga poses look okay, but you know, I'd leave yoga and, and notice, Oh, I'm slumping in the car or I, you know, I'm slumping at my desk. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not something that's going to change overnight, but if you can start becoming more aware of it and making small, small incremental changes, that can really contribute to healing your pelvic floor. Um, you know, like a really common instruction in fitness classes with abdominal work is push your lower back into the floor. Um, you know, now that instruction is given, it's safer than letting your lower back over arch, but long term, if you've been slumping all day over your desk and then you're pushing your lower back into the floor, again, it's, it's again, contributing to shortening your pelvic floor. So, you know, it's, you have to look at the whole picture. Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of my teaching is it, it's not just one thing. We always want to blame, like, what is this one thing? Or, you know, I did this one thing and this happened, but but the one thing is usually just something that pushed you over the edge. It isn't, it isn't the actual cause. It's the, it's the contributor that pushed you from not noticing to noticing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think that's important for people to realize it's not just one thing, but then what are they doing with their bodies beyond the yoga class? Ever since doing your course and really getting into this, I start looking at people's bodies, um, walking down the street, like tail tucker or like yes. hair extension. And I'm like, I have a sense of your pelvic floor. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> so what are one or two takeaways that everyone can do daily that can just simply help create a little more balance in their pelvic floor? Um, I, you know, I honestly, uh, you know, people ask me what one yoga pose, really it's what, well, maybe you know, your yoga pose, maybe you're, just, well, let, me, let me back up because you know, yeah. Okay. I'll give you one or two yoga poses, but really what's more important is what you're doing Outside of your yoga class. Yeah, so not even a yoga pose. Maybe just... No. Can you stand up feeling like you're lifting up through the crown of your head? Can you sit up on your sitting bones? Can you consciously breathe so that your body receives... That's actually what I was looking for. <laughs> What's that? That's actually what I was looking for for an answer. Yeah. Just the right. breathing. <laughs> yeah, so those things are, are more important. Not that I don't love and live by yoga. But, you know, it's like I don't live in my yoga practice. You know, it's like my practice, my practice is to help make the rest of my life better. 
you know, that my hour, my hour and a half of practice every day is so that I can breathe better out in my, in my life. It's so I can sit better in my car. It's, you know, so those are the two most important things, conscious, good breathing, uh, sitting, standing more, uh, more correctly, not, not kind of slumping or shifting onto one side or jutting one hip out, which women do a lot. Um, not holding your stomach in to make you look thin. Uh, these are not things that are helping your health. Um, if I had to say two yoga postures, Tadasana, okay, very under, under taught pose, but Tadasana really, if you really understand Tadasana and do it well, and then carry that into your standing poses, that can be super helpful. Um, and then I think Dandasana, Dandasana, uh, if you understand Dandasana being up on so staff pose, being up on your sitting bones, think of Dandasana as downward dog. Uh, Dandasana is the template for all the seated forward bends. Um, yeah, that, those would be, you know, Malasana squatting is really good, but squatting with your heels elevated so that you're not tucking your pelvis. And then also just um, saying if you have, if you know you have a prolapse, not so good to do malasana. So just be careful of that. So no squatting. If you know you have a prolapse, uh, those are some of my favorite poses for the pelvic floor. Yeah. I think the one that, what I try to instill in my students is just to find their breath because so many people stick up here. So if they're never even really thought about their pelvic floor, you know, when someone, my genre is pre and postnatal, so they're starting to get in touch with their body. But if they've walked in, never really have done any yoga or worked with their body, their pelvic floor might feel very foreign. So just getting them to breathe and let the breath reach down has been a, a great tool. And I've learned so much from you. So where can people find you nowadays? What are you up to? Do you have a new book out that you want to talk about? You must be psychic. <laughs> okay. My website is my name, lesliehowardyoga.com. Um, but you can also find me at pelvicfloryoga.com if you can't remember how to spell my name. Um, and then my new book is called Pelvic Liberation. So you can also find me at pelvicliberation.com. It'll all, they'll all bring you to the same place. Um, but I did finally finish a book, which was like birthing a baby for me. And, um, uh, basically, you know, kind of wrapping up what I've said today in, in this little short interview is that, you know, your pelvic floor issues don't happen because of one thing. And so I asked the reader to think about their history, what I call the story of your pelvis. Can you, you know, write down, think about everything that's happened to you. I couldn't be happier about the hashtag me too, um, stuff that's going on that we're talking about this stuff, uh, that women are feeling confident about coming forward because, because all this stuff contributes to tension in the pelvic floor. Um, you know, we don't, we're, we're not comfortable talking about this stuff. And, and part of what my work is about is can we just normalize the conversation? Can we just talk about this stuff? Like we would, you know, I have a cold, I have a pelvic, I have pelvic floor pain. That, and people shouldn't feel weird about it. It's just another part of the body. Um, so anyway, so that's what's going on. I Right now I'm in Salt Lake City teaching uh, pelvic floor teacher training, which I do a couple times a year. It's a 20-hour training for you know, doulas, midwives, yoga teachers, inter just interested parties. Um, but it's therapeutic application of yoga for um, pelvic floor issues. Uh, I'm happy to say I've got two medical studies, uh, under my belt with UCSF. Um, so I have a little bit of credibility on the street and, uh, yeah, so that's it. That's where you can find me. I'm so happy yeah. that you came on and spoke. Um, I've known about your work for years. I love studying with you and a lot of what you've teach is in our community in the, in the New York city community. So thank you for always offering your, your wisdom. Thank you. I, it has become my passion and I really, it's from my heart and from my pelvis <laughs> that I want to help other women. And I want, I, in my trainings about, you know, training women to help other women. And that's really what it's all about because that's how movements start. Yes. And yes. so one pelvis so, at a time, one pelvis at a time. <laughs> Let's start the pelvic revolution. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Right, Debra, be well. Be well. Take, take care. care. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Step into the world of power, loyalty, 
and luck. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you wanna get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather, now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.